We are on part two, chapter seven, and in this section we are going to discuss wireless access points, which could just as well be called be called wireless switches. As you know, in Wi-Fi, a workstation with a wireless network interface card can connect to a wireless access point or the wireless network interface card might be built into the motherboard of the laptop. To connect to a wireless network in which service set identifier broadcasting is enabled on the wireless access point, to connect to that, we go to the bottom of the screen in Windows 7 and we select the icon the network connection icon. We click on that icon and it gives us a list of all the other wireless networks which are available and the reason that we can see them is because the wireless access point is currently broadcasting. So I select the network I want to connect to and I click on connect and then that connects me to the wireless network and if I click on full map I can see all of the other wireless computers which are running on the wireless network. Two disadvantages of Wi-Fi related to security are unauthorized access and eavesdropping. Let's just say you live in the top floor of an apartment building. Well, and you have a, a wireless network interface card and you have a wireless router. Well, the people downstairs could tap in to your wireless router to get unauthorized access and that's going to slow you down a little bit. But even worse, somebody downstairs with a wireless computer and a protocol analyzer on that wireless computer could intercept any packets which you are sending to the wireless access point and they could potentially steal any passwords or credit card numbers. So to address those two threats. We implement Wi-Fi security. It means we disable service set identifier broadcasting on the wireless access point. We type in a passphrase. It's like a password. People have passwords, but pieces of hardware have passphrases. And we enable encryption. We go to the wireless access point. We disable service set identifier broadcasting, then we type in the service set identifier, which is another word for the name of the network. We type in the passphrase and we enable encryption. We do that on the wireless access point. Then we go to the wireless client and we enter the service set identifier, the same number that we typed in on the wireless access point. We type in a passphrase, the same passphrase that we typed in on the wireless access point, and we enable encryption. So first let's do it to the wireless access point, then let's do it to the router. To get to the, uh, then let's do it to the workstation. To get to the wireless access point or the wireless router, you typically type 192.168.1.1, and that connects you to the wireless access point. You enable wireless, you disable service set identifier broadcasting and then you type in the name of the service set identifier which is the name of the wireless network. You then enable security and encryption and then you type in a passphrase and they call the passphrase a key code on this wireless router. Sometimes they call it a passphrase, sometimes they call it a key code. You type that information in on the wireless access point. Then you go to the workstation and you type in the service set identifier, the passphrase, and you enable encryption. You go to the workstation under network and internet, under manage wireless networks, and click on add. Then you type in the service set identifier, meaning the name of the computer. Why do we need to type this in? because SSID broadcasting was disabled on the wireless access point. Then we enable security and encryption, 
and then we type in the security key, which they also call a passphrase, followed by next. We click on the checkbox that says connect automatically when the network is in range, and we select the checkbox that says connect even if the network is not broadcasting. Well, that's the whole reason we're doing this, because it's not broadcasting. If it weren't broadcasting, if it were broadcasting, we wouldn't even need to do this. So I click on OK. So in wireless security, I disable broadcasting on the wireless access point, I enable encryption, and I type in a passphrase, and then I go to the workstations, and I type in the service set identifier, I enable encryption, and I type in the passphrase. Another form of wireless security is called MAC address filtering, and as you know, a MAC address is a serial number which is burned into the network interface card. And if you only want to allow specific workstations to connect to this wireless access point, you go to the wireless access point and you type in the MAC address of every workstation that you want to connect. That's not a bad way to go if you have a small number of workstations, but if you have a, a large number of computers, it, it's just way too much typing to try to type in the MAC address of every single computer which you want to give access. So usually you only use MAC address filtering in rather small networks. Now let's talk about network interface cards on page 314. We will discuss purpose, types, and network interface card installation. A network interface card, as you know, is a circuit board that has a port in the back to plug an Ethernet cable into. And the network interface card typically plugs into a slot into the motherboard. The network interface card is a circuit board which plugs into a slot into the motherboard, then a cable plugs in from the network interface card to the switch. A network interface card converts a parallel signal to a serial signal. In other words, the computer runs at parallel internally, but it uses serial communications to communicate externally, to communicate between computers. But first, let's do a review of the difference between serial and parallel. If one computer is going to send 8 bits to another computer over a single wire, then the bits are set, sent one after the other, one bit after the other in a series. That's called serial transmission, one bit after another. How long does it take to send 8 bits? Well, it takes 8 times as long as it takes to send one bit. That's serial. Now let's, let's look at parallel. Parallel transmission is typically used within a computer to connect the CPU to memory. And whereas in serial transmission there's only a single wire, in parallel transmission we have eight wires, and all eight bits can be transmitted at the same time. So you can see that Parallel transmission is going to be eight times faster than serial transmission because it sends eight bits at a time. This is called eight, this is called parallel eight bit transmission. Parallel sixteen bit transmission is where we send sixteen bits at a time, and parallel thirty two is where thirty two bits are sent at the same time. And of course we have parallel sixty four bit transmission as well. So a network interface card converts the serial, the parallel signal, and that's how a computer runs internally, to a serial signal, and that's how computers communicate externally between computers. Now let's discuss what's meant by PC buses. And when they talk about PC buses, like 8-bit, 16-bit, 32-bit, they are talking about the different types of slots on the motherboard. You get 8-bit, 16-bit, 32-bit slots on the motherboard, and these are called PC buses. Now, one of the oldest type of PC buses was what they call ISA, Industry Standard Architecture, and ISA 8-bit was an 8-bit bus, and it could transmit data at a theoretical maximum of 20 megabits per second. ISA 16-bit was twice as wide, 
and it could send data through at 66 megabits per second. Wait a minute, that's not twice as fast, that's three times as fast. Well, actually, not only is the bus width wider, but it sends the data through at higher clock speeds. But nobody uses industry standard architecture 8-bit or 16-bit anymore. One of the most commonly used network interface cards you see uses the PCI 32-bit bus. PCI stands for Peripheral Component Interface, and with a 32-bit bus, it can send data through at a theoretical maximum of 133 megabits per second. PCI 32-bit very, very commonly used in computers, particularly desktop computers. Now, PCI Express uses a 32-bit bus, and that is really not used on workstations so much. You will see that more on servers. That runs at a 32 max, a, 30, a theoretical maximum of one gigabit per second. But really, PCI Express is not used so much these days. What's really used mostly on high-end servers these days is PCI Express times one. PCI Express uses a high-speed serial bus, which pushes the data through at a theoretical maximum of 8 gigabits per second, much, much faster than any other of the PCI bus types. This is this is a PCI Express times one, and this is a, a network interface card. Now, PCI Express times 16 is also used for video cards, but for the focus, for our focus, which is as network engineers, we're going to be using mostly PCI Express times one network interface cards. So a network interface card is a circuit board which can be inserted into a slot into the motherboard, and there are different types of slots, 18-bit, 16-bit, 32-bit. Or the network interface card can be built into the motherboard. Now let's talk about installing network interface cards. Two parts, hardware installation and software installation. Hardware installation is easy. You take the top off the computer, Take the network interface card, push it in place, and screw it in good and tight. Then you load the network interface card drivers. And with many computers these days, when you turn the computer on, the operating system auto detects the hardware and auto loads the drivers. And that's great. Makes things really easy. However, they don't call us when the drivers properly auto load, they call us when the drivers don't auto load. And if the drivers don't auto load, we have to manually install the drivers, either using the manufacturer's DVD, which comes with the network interface card when you buy it, or by downloading the driver from the internet. How, well, now, wait a minute. How can I download the driver from the internet if I can't connect to the internet because I don't have the drivers for the network interface card? Well, what you would have to do is go to another computer which did have an internet connection and then download the drivers on that computer. So what we do to download the drivers from the internet, you go to the manufacturer's website for the type of computers that you use. At CCBC we use a lot of Hewlett Packard computers, so we go to hewlettpackard.com and we select support and drivers. Then we type in the type of computer that we're trying to find the network interface card driver for and we use a lot of DC 78100s. So I type in DC 78100 followed by Go, and there is a picture which th shows the computers that we use here at CCBC. And then to download the drivers and software, I click on Download Drivers and Software, and I select the drivers for the network interface card. Now at this point, I could select run to install the drivers on this computer, or I could save the drivers to a USB drive and then carry them over to the computer that does not have the internet connection. To show you how to install the drivers, it's easy. You click on run, you click on next, you accept the licensing agreement, you click on next, and it downloads the drivers and installs them on the local PC.
to verify whether or not those drivers have been installed, you go to Control Panel, and under Hardware and Sound, you go to Device Manager. And under Device Manager, if you right-click on the network connection and select Properties, you can see under the Driver tab that we have loaded the driver for the Intel Gigabit Network Interface Card. So when you install network interface cards, hardware installation means you plug it in. Software installation is where the drivers load, and on a good day, the drivers auto-load. But when the drivers do not auto-load, we have to manually install the drivers, either from a manufacturer's install disk, or we have to download the drivers from the Internet. Now let's go to page 318 and discuss what's meant by a PIXI, pre-boot execution, network interface card. But before we can discuss what Pixie is, let's just review what you mean by booting a computer. What does it mean to boot from the hard disk? Well, when you boot a computer, what it means is you turn the computer on and the operating system is pulled off of the hard disk and loaded into RAM. And when the operating system is loaded into RAM, then the computer is said to be booted. Typically, the operating system is pulled off of the hard disk and loaded into RAM. But as you know, you can also boot from a DVD, or you can boot from a USB drive, or you can do a network boot using a PIXI network interface card. Typically, PIXI is used in conjunction with remote installations. So here's the situ situation. I have a computer right here that has no operating system installed, and I want to install Windows 7 on it. I have a deployment server up here, and the deployment server stores images of Windows 7, which can be used for an over-the-wire installation. So I need to connect the workstation to the server to do an over-the-wire installation. But how can I possibly connect to the server if I can't get booted, and I can't get booted because I don't have an operating system? But if this computer has a PIXI network interface card, then I can boot to the network. I turn the computer on, and the PIXI card connects to the server, and I boot to the server. Then my computer, the workstation, downloads the Windows 7 installation image over the wire, and now Windows 7 is installed on this computer. If we look at Microsoft technet.com, we can see that the way to initiate a Pixie boot is to press F12 upon boot up. So a Pixie network interface card is where a Pixie boots from the network and it's typically used in conjunction with a remote installation. Chapter 7, Summary. In this chapter we discussed what is a hub, what's a switch, what is a router, and what is RIP, the routing information protocol. We discussed wireless networking, wireless security, and different types of network interface cards and network interface card installation. And this concludes Chapter 7. Thank you very much, and have a nice day.